managing the time very vigorously, so we have to keep to time. Um, so we're now 10.29, let's get ahead of the game and start holding it early. May I introduce um, Professor Jean-Paul Fournier from Nice, who's going to be speaking to us about peer teaching for clinical reasoning training in hi-fi simulation. So thank you, Professor. I do my best. I do the very time. So, uh, medical errors is a very, very important problem in managing patients, with very important consequence for the patients, for the institutions, and in front for the state. This group deals with this problem and develops a model of clinical reasoning and uses some very important point in which simulation may be very efficient. And as you may see, there is a major impact of training. This is a very recent evidence in which, once more, simulation appears to be very efficient in making diagnosis. Unfortunately, there is a very important drawback in simulation, I mean in EFI simulation, with the shortage of faculties. So maybe peer teaching may be a kind solution. Peer teachers work very well. They are at least as efficient and maybe more efficient than the faculty. They are very appreciated by their colleagues. They are less expensive than teachers. Mm -hmm. And they can do it academic rewards for their participation. But in this particular domain, if it's evaluation, there is very, very, very rare evidence of using peer teachers. This is a pity because for several reasons there is important tool in which simulation can be used by peer teachers. We can reproduce the same errors in the simulation lab that in the real life. We can reproduce clinical reasoning errors in the simulation lab. Residents perform as well as faculty for the briefing, which is a major part of simulations. So, we developed this program a few years ago. The question was can we improve clinical reasoning of medical students with simulation? Third year medical students were involved in this uh, research. They have script concordant tests, which is a well-known format using to, um, to assess clinical reasoning with a certainty context. And then they had four simulation sessions, including eight scenarios and another SCT. For the both SCT, we use the same question, the same vignette, but in order models. And then we compared their performance before and after the simulation session, and those performances were compared to medical students of four years. I mean, students who had one year more clinical experience, but no simulation sessions. Uh, what was the result? One, they performed very well, and the difference was significant. Second, there was no statistical difference between their performance after the simulation session and the performance of the fourth year medical students. Third, the weakest students in SCT were the world for whom the improvement was the most important. But we want to confirm those results. And the research question was, can we confirm those results? There were some limitations in the first research. Can we confirm that we have the same progression between peer teaching and faculty attending? And is there significant and long-lasting academic improvement for peer teachers? To address those questions, we developed this program. First, the scenario where very crassly building to aim 
the, self, the, self, the student's learning objective. They were strictly integrated in the curriculum. We used a very realistic environment. Students are to make history taking and physical examination. They were given biological and imaging tests as soon as they were ordered. Treatment and physical variation were uh, scheduled. And they are to call for specialists and to call for word slot at each time, so twice by scenario, they had to make a summary of the case to the attending physician. We had two scenarios by session. For the first scenario one, we had three students as actors and three students as spectators in the same room. Then for scenario it was contrary, actors become spectators and spectators become actors. Biological and imaging test results were available for the complete group, so the six students, as well the briefing. The briefing has two parts. It's part one, we use a checklist with key points of history taking and physical examination, key points of past medical history, identification of the patient medical problem, differential diagnosis, pros and cons for each diagnosis hypothesis, and part two, take home message. The first part lasts 15 minutes, the second 15 minutes, and the third one 15 minutes, so 45 minutes for one scenario, and eight, uh, 90 minutes for two scenarios and one session. Spears. Spears were recruited among fourth and fifth year medical students on voluntary basis. They were training in group gestion, they were training in using the simulator and the resources of the simulation lab, and they had to prepare the scenario with local guidelines and focusing on uh, students' learning objective. Here the example we used, the scenario were played with faculty and we find it necessary until they worked. Randomization was on a two-one fashion with two um, rooms with uh, peers and one room with uh, faculty. The three rooms worked independently. For students, we make comparison with their uh, age, sex ratio, and second takers and their scores in academic test before simulation semester one. They had the script column tests with the same pattern as the previous study, and we made comparison between second and third year medical students, pre and post test peer versus faculty. For the peers, the same pattern, age, sex ratio, second takers, scores in academic test before the simulation, scores in academic test after simulation, so the same year. And for post-stimulation academic test, topics were balanced between those who were <coughs> treated in simulation and those who were not treated in simulations. Scores were used the following years, and the ranking of the national ranking examination were used for fifth year medical students who take this examination during the, uh, the end of the six years. What were the results? There were no difference between groups for the students. There was, there was a significant improvement in their performance either in second or in third year. With a paired analysis, there were no difference between the improvement they had either with peer teaching or with faculty. This was the same result for second and third year medical students. What about the peers? No difference but one, just a sex ratio in one year. What about the results? They had the same improvement just after the evaluation session in fourth or in fifth year medical students. They had the same progression for prepared and taught contents and for unprepared and untaught content. One year later, they had the same progression. In summary, in summary, we could confirm our previous results. We have the same progression with tutors and peer teachers. There was an improvement for peers, whatever the group was, and the improvement was important and persisted at least one year. Why did it work? In fact, peer teachers are very efficient for at least three reasons. The first one, is what they call 
So firm congruency, in fact, peers act as a model for their students. The second point is what they call cognitive congruence. In fact, they act as cognitive coach for the students. But if we ask them, do you want your, peer, your uh, faculty to be replaced by peers? The response is no, not yet. Why if simulation work? In fact, we use some very important cognitive principles. The case, the case were very closely aimed at learning objectives and integrity in the curriculum. We use a realistic environment, in fact. We try to reduce the cognitive load. History taking and physical examination, biological imaging tests, treatment and physiological variation, in fact, used to be able to make some connection between the diagnosis, the clinical presentation, the biological and imaging tests. The summarization of the case was very important. In fact, we use the script theory and we try to make some script acquisition. Second point, we use two scenarios for one symptom. For instance, you said acute shortness of breath with pulmonary edema or community acute pulmonary edema. In fact, we use symptom and not diagnosis. We made a position between two diagnoses of the same symptoms. And so we facilitate transfer. Second, the key point of past medical history, identification of patient medical problem, the first diagnosis and point cause each diagnostic hypothesis. We use the dual process reasoning and deliberate reflection. Why was it efficient for our peers? Dedicated time, no, according to our, stu our students. Stress, no, according to our students. Memory stimulation, maybe for those. But the most important were they, better, they had better knowledge acquisition and organization. And now, and now, how all the sessions are ruled by peers with the same preparation. And we are developing two new programs, one in physiology, second medical years, and another one for procedural simulation for third medical years. Thank you for your attention. So do we have questions for Professor Fournier? There are microphones in your desk. Perhaps I could start off while, we, uh, while you're just having a think. Um, it's very interesting that clearly your students are performing just as well with the peer teaching, but actually they're not quite ready to have teaching from peers yet. So how are you managing that transition? Because it's really it's really about the, the psychology and emotion, isn't it, rather than the practical performance? <coughs> yeah, in fact, um, uh, the result I showed was the result from the literature. And we didn't ask your students to want us to disappear and be replaced by you. We, we were afraid of the reality. <laughs> okay. Uh, other questions? Yes. Please. How do you select the peers? On voluntary basis. And this is very, uh, very important because uh, when we began, we were anxious to have enough peers. And now we are anxious to have too much peers. And in fact, this is um, a, a circle uh, system because students became peers and so uh, the system works. And it works very nicely. Do you, do you pay your peers? Or do no. Pay no. But, but um, uh, we can give them some, uh, some aid with uh, uh, the academic test because if they lack some, uh, uh, so, some marks, we can help them. In fact, this is something very official, but this is something very, uh, very rare about less than 8% of our peers need this help. So you've got a win-win situation. Absolutely. This is a win for which it works, I suppose. Okay. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs> so moving on, our next presentation is on cognitive task analysis of hip replacement, thinking and performing like an expert surgeon. 
and it's going to be prevented, uh, presented for us by Brian Van <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, Professor Smith, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is uh, Brandon Van Rudgen, um, from London, Imperial College London, at the MSK Lab, um, where I'm a clinical research fellow at the moment. And today, what I want to talk to you about is uh, cognitive task analysis and how to think uh, like an expert surgeon. So, in days gone by, surgeons have been perceived to be uh, like this chap here, uh, someone who you know, performs bold strokes of technical skill. However, in reality, um, with surgery, well, surgical competence, it's an amalgamation of not only uh, technical skill, but also decision making. And as we've heard from the talks thus far today, with the, the way that surgery is embracing surgical technology, the element of decision making becomes paramount. So Jens Rasmussen uh, discussed how Innate ability is not something that is uh, true, but it's more a case of a systematic approach of learning. So the learner initially uh, obtains their knowledge, um, and then by obtaining this knowledge, are able to um, perform rule-based behaviors to execute that task, and eventually will be able to have skill-based behaviors to create an automated action. So we wanted to perform a formula to understand how do we get this automated action in the learning process, which can be applied across the board. And we came up with this formula, whereby the expert who creates this automated action, it's an amalgamation of training, which involves the technical skill and the non-technical skill, um, which is alongside experience, which takes into play volume and variety. So we use simulators um, fairly extensively, and that takes into play the technical skill and the volume and uses that within a safe environment. However, we don't really consider the non-technical skills and the variety. And this is where we believe cognitive training has um, great potential. So with cognitive task analysis, we wanted to understand how can we get into someone's head and understand how an expert conducts the procedure. And in, for our, in our experiment, it was for uh, hip replacement. And what we believe is that this could complement simulators that we currently have at hand. So currently in surgery, we have something that is not too dissimilar to an IKEA manual. Essentially what it does, as we can see here from an IKEA manual that I found, to build a cupboard, all we have to do is, we're literally just following a sequential series of steps. Now having built a few IKEA cupboards in my university days, I can tell you it's not that straightforward, and actually we have to understand the, pep the certain pearls and possible challenges that we can uh, come across whilst building the cover, whether it be different equipment, lack of screws, whatever it may be. But we need to know how to overcome this, and this is where cognitive training is so apt. So for our method methodology, we use three elements of cognitive task analysis. One, being critical incidents. Two, questionnaire and interviews, and lastly, controlled observation. And here's a good example of a controlled observation whereby an expert surgeon is conducting the procedure and then retrospectively reports the thoughts, decisions, and cues um, that would be useful for his trainee. And then also we created a semi-formal interview structure where they created a concept map and what this meant is that we would understand how the expert thought from the inception of the surgery to the completion of the surgery and what possible complexities he may encounter during the process and how he overcomes that, the non-technical aspects that we discussed earlier. And then we delved a bit deeper and we looked at the critical incidents and so we postulated questions to that surgeon and said, you know, if, for example, a novice was to have come across a certain challenge, for example, the you know, in the manual that we have, we have certain tools that we use, and say if that tool wasn't available, what would you use then to overcome that potential challenge during this procedure? And then we used, we had six experts across the world, um, from Canada, USA, in uh, UK with Professor Cobb, and we had to understand how these experts 
Evidently, each expert would have their own way of doing things. But we needed to standardize things because for a learner to gain the knowledge and also gain the understanding of how to conduct a procedure, or in a more broader sense, to understand a concept in the learning environment, we need to understand there needs to be a basis and a standard. And for that, we use the Delphi method, which is an evidence-based approach to ensure that we are, that any, any, train, any trainee in the uh, environment of surgery has the ability to have a standardized learning opportunity. The important thing with the Delphi method is that each expert had to agree. And that's crucial because that then ensures the standardization of the learning opportunity. And eventually we came up with these uh, tables. And these tables essentially show different stages of the operation. And also, more importantly, it was not just about the technical steps, but we were also able to understand what possible errors and challenges you would encounter and how you'd overcome those. So from this, with the Digital Hub at Imperial College London, we created a website which was an interactive platform for learning. And as we've heard today, the, you know, the days of ditching the textbook and now we're embracing digital technology, we now have a tool for our students and trainees to then be able to understand the material at hand. Uh, not too dissimilar, well it's almost uh, the same as the MOOCs that we discussed earlier during this um, conference. So let's delve into the website. So it took us through the journey for the patient from the initial consultation to the understanding of x-rays to then also explaining the basic steps but also the pearls of, and possible challenges that one could encounter and also then be able to apply that to the specific step in that operation. I do apologize for some gruesome imaging. Uh, and so then moving on from that, we were we wanted to do then question, you know, we do have this website at hand, but we're in the day and age now where we have apps, a plethora of them on our phones, and we wanted to be able to give the information and the learning opportunity to the and put the onus on the trainee. And that's why we then had this collaboration with Touch Surgery. And this is wonderful because what it enabled um, was it enabled the surgical trainee to have on their app the exact procedure. And as you can see here, so on the main menu, you'd select the specific hip operation. But within that, we've also compartmentalized different aspects of the surgery. And why this is important is it allows people to, instead of going on the website and having to go through the whole process, we can actually snip it into exactly where we feel weak in our understanding and then substantiate that with the, web, with the app that we have here. And what was important as well was that the cognitive task analysis looks at the non-technical skills and also then makes the decision-making process come to the fore for that trainee. And as you can see here, if you could kindly press play, Whilst conducting the procedure, we also have the information underneath so that the trainee is starting to think in a different manner from the archetypical task-based analysis that we have at hand. So in summary, we're moving from task-based training to cognitive-based training and assessment. And this is quite exciting because we used a cognitive task analysis method. We substantiated that with the Delphi method. We ensured that we had a standardized method globally for understanding the operation at hand. But again, this is something that can be in the broader context of learning. And we validated that and now have an open access tool which trainees can use, not only on a website, but in the very palm of their hand. And it really does put the power to the trainee in terms of the learning opportunities at hand. And this is something that we find very exciting and complements very much so with uh, my colleague, Kartik Logishetti, who whereby we've created a simulator, uh, which is a fully immersive VR simulator, uh, which is just in the background there we can see. And what it does is that cognitive-based training, as we discussed at the beginning, can complement the simulation to ensure that we have an open, interactive tool for understanding a possible, in our case, a hip operation, but in a broader context, taking the decision-making to the fore of the learning process. And I must say thank you to everyone involved from <coughs> Imperial College London um, for allowing this to happen. Thank you very much. Okay, so do we have questions? It's quite a 
and especially stereo, I guess. Um, so, do you think that the success of this method is down to the way you actually designed it in the first place, i.e. The, the cognitive task analysis and the way you broke the task down, mm. or the fact that you put it on, the, on, a, on an app? Do you, or do you think it, it has to be the combination of the two? Do you think you could have either element separately? Thank you for the question. Um, so to address uh, that in two parts, firstly, I think there is importance in terms of, with the cognitive task analysis, I think that it's a broader tool. And although we have applied it here for hip surgery, it is something that we, it's the concept of the understanding for cognitive task analysis. And it, it's almost similar to what I showed in the formula earlier, taking that, the non-decision making, the, the non-technical skills, and specifically the decision making aspect, and also incorporating that with variety. And that makes it slightly different in terms of the learning process from the task-based process that we have or the didactic nature of teaching previously. And I think the, that in tandem with the online interactive tools that we have at hand makes it a much better learning opportunity in the modern age um, and really embraces the modern pedagogy within surgical training or elsewhere in um, the training process. Please answer your uh, uh, Having had a hip replacement, okay. uh, I'm wondering if you followed up with the patients um, who, have, who have undergone uh, the hip replacement with that, the people who have been trained in the process. Mm. Is, is there a significant difference in their um, in the uh, post-operative experience? Okay, uh, thank you for your question. So in terms of what we have here, this is the conceptual process and we're now implementing that into our VR, so virtual reality simulation. The, what we have here in terms of the operation is something that is widely recognized and it's, a much, it's an up and coming method of operation. We haven't had any patience for this. This is more specifically, what we did in this study was the cognitive task analysis within virtual reality simulation. So we wanted to make it a safe tool for the trainees, especially junior trainees from Canada and England, to get a grasp of the surgery and then possibly in the future assist on this operation with more understanding and better ability to conduct decisions alongside the lead surgeon. Um, but it still comes down to the pedal hitting mm -hmm. the metal, okay? Yeah. Uh, so that would be an interesting... Is oh. there a translation and a significant impact in the efficacy of this procedure? Yeah. Okay? So, you know, I mean, yeah, so from the patient's perspective, it's one thing to, to look at it from the, from the, from the doctor's perspective. Yeah. But it's another thing to look at it from the patient's perspective. Oh, precisely, definitely. I think, so I'm hoping that yeah. there is a translation. Yeah. You know, it's a significant surgery. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're completely right. I think ev everything that the, a doctor endeavors to do is patient centered. Um, so, although the learning process is important, the important thing here as well that we have to appreciate is that the better understanding and better decision making processes that are absorbed from this process will only benefit the patient and also improve um, that process with the patient and the journey of the patient uh, through the operation, as is the case for yourself. We have a lot of data from prior inception yeah. of this. Yeah. I, it might be nice to oh, yes, yeah, certainly. Down the road. Yeah. There's another question at the back. Hi. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon myself, so this talk will be very interesting. Um, does your simulation also consider all the possible complications that can occur during the course of the surgery, and did you factor that in into the, uh, into the cognitive decision making? Like for example, uh, you're reaming the bone, the bone breaks, what do you do next? You encounter too much bleeding during the approach, what do you do next? Yeah. Uh, similar to what, uh, we ha what happened during uh, pre-operative conferences, these are the these are the challenges which are usually thrown to the mm. surgeon trainee. Mm. Hey, what do you do if uh, the, the wrong side? Mm. Questions there is some. Uh, so, um, um, thank you for your question. And, and that question really excites me because what cognitive task analysis did uh, from when we had the, so when we conducted the Delphi method, 
and we went and spoke to these expert surgeons across the globe. What we gained from them was exactly like yourself, you know, not just the basics of how to conduct and how the learning process, but also how to overcome those potential challenges. And we had to standardize things. So, I mean, you know, for example, as you say, you know, whilst so in the process for those who are not in the orthopedic world here, when we are implanting the head, we need to make sure that within the pelvis the congruency works out. It's a bit like just fitting it something in, and as you're saying, you know, the possible complications that encountered during that were standardised across the board from these surgeons to gain an understanding of what the most common possible complications are, and then we factored that in to the learning process, so that these, when people are learning, it's not just about understanding the process of conducting the surgery, but also about the decision-making process when those challenges arise. Great, thank you very much. I'm afraid we're going to have to move on. Right, thank you. Hopefully you'll be at Transform Med Ed next year. You can tell us the patient perspective as well. So thank you. So our next speaker is going to speak to us about evidence supporting dual process theory of medical diagnosis, a functional near infrared spectroscopy study by Jerome Rothkins, I hope I haven't mangled your name too much. <laughs> and Jerome is here at LKC Medicine, so now we're looking into the brain. Sorry. This is great here. <coughs> I can even put it on different uh, different uh, screens. Like, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, slightly different topic. Um, more of a fundamental research on the neuroscientific evidence supporting dual process theory of medical diagnosis. Before I start, let me quickly uh, mention the team, the research team. It's a collaborative effort between LKC Medicine and Erasmus University Medical Center in the Netherlands. Uh, and also this research is supported by the National Research Foundation in uh, Singapore. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the nature of medical diagnosis remains something of an enigma. And the mystery is caused by the fact that we do not really know what's going on in the brain when generating a diagnosis. It's evident that knowledge and expertise are involved, but how this knowledge and expertise are stored in memory and, re and more importantly, the retrieve from memory and apply during the diagnostic process is hardly unknown. <coughs> now, to study this diagnostic reasoning process, there is a uh, leading theory, a leading framework. It's called dual process theory. And as the name suggests, the theory uh, says that there are two independent systems. There is system one and there is system two. And system one is the fast and intuitive heuristic system. Now it's a, a physician who uh, uh, sees a patient and immediately knows what's, uh, what's wrong with him or not. Now system two is the slow, <coughs> the deliberate analytical system where you weigh all the signs and symptoms uh, in order to reach a diagnosis. Important to note is that this theory assumes that these two systems are independent systems in the brain. They're separate. The problem, however, is that we do not have sufficient evidence to support this assumption. There are studies that use many behavior, behavioral indicators, such as called diagnostic uh, accuracy and response time, but these findings are too true to say something about this. Now, what these findings demonstrate is that physicians with more expertise generate more accurate and more faster diagnosis than physicians with less expertise. <coughs> uh, this is quite evident, uh, but the point here is that these findings uh, do not tell us something that these are different systems. It could be the same system, but it's just faster. Now, now, the objective of this study was to find evidence for this dual process theory by using neuroimaging techniques. And we can directly look into the brain and can see are there really two independent, two different systems. 
And that is really important for the validity of the theory. It's a very influential theory, but until now, there is no convincing uh, neuroscientific uh, support for it. Now, <clears throat> if you think back of how I just defined system two, uh, analytic, slow, deliberate, uh, this system two is associated with brain processes in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, uh, analytical reasoning, uh, it has to do something with working memory, it has to do with uh, the executive function, and we know from other studies that this is in the prefrontal cortex. So what we hypothesize is that if we instill system two thinking in our participants, that you would see a, a prefrontal cortex activity. It's like a light switch. If you go to system one, this prefrontal cortex activity should not occur because it is somewhere else in the brain. Where is not important at this stage, but somewhere else. Now every time that we go to system two, prefrontal cortex activity, if you go to system one, there shouldn't be such an activity. Now in our study, we uh, have 25 uh, year two students participated, and we developed a new experimental paradigm for this. In fact, it is uh, a paradigm where one of our colleagues works on it as a PhD. Uh, but what we did in here is we have eight chest x rays, uh, bulla emphysema, fibrosis, pneumothorax, collapse, consolidation, effusion, and lung mass. And what we did is we had various phases. We had first a femoralization phase. All these cases were presented, and you see it's a medical condition here, it's a definition of what it is, and then three of the most striking signs and symptoms, and there were some annotations on the chest x ray as well. Then, after this, we had a learning phase, and this was really a long phase. We, we showed the participants a chest exit without annotation, and they had to provide us with a diagnosis. MCQ, and if they got it wrong, they would see this image again. So it was kind of a learning feedback. If you get it wrong, you go back to this slide, then you continue. And we did that 80 times, 80, 90 times. The average was 80 times. So you, uh, we'll get faster and faster and better and better at in diagnosing these, uh, these four out of eight chest x-rays. Yeah. Now the idea was here that we uh, instill pattern recognition, system one, analytic fast recognition. We even had a time trial in there. If they were too slow, then they had to do another round of 20 images. At the end, we had a test phase where all eight cases were presented again. So now we have a situation where we have four cases where they were very well trained in, uh, fast recognition and eight cases that they only had seen one. Now, in doing that last phase, what we did is we uh, scanned their brain. Now, what we used is a uh, 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 near infrared spectroscopy uh, 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 system. It's portable, it's uh, uh, very cost efficient, uh, and we only measure the prefrontal cortex in response. To, to the cases to see what happens in response to the cases that they were not trained in. Of course, besides uh, the uh, neuroimaging measures, uh, uh, neuroimaging measures, we also had the conventional uh, behavioral measures like diagnostic accuracy score and response time. Um, let's look at these first. And the behavioral results suggest that we were successful in instilling uh, uh, system one thinking. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the case of the learning phase, in these four cases, you see that their uh, diagnostic accuracy for these four cases that they saw repeatedly was significantly higher for the cases that they were not trained. Also, the response time was significantly uh, uh, faster for the cases that they were trained in than they were not trained in, which is to be expected. Um, but the important and interesting thing is now what happened between the cases where they were not trained in? And if our thought is correct, you should see a prefrontal cortex of uh, activity. Uh, look at this part, it says the red, it says trained and untrained, and that's what you see what happens when <coughs> the sort of trained cases, uh, the familiar cases, you see no activity as a short break, and now comes the untrained cases, that you only saw one at the beginning, and you see a significant uh, activation. Of course, there's only one participant. If you overlap these data, uh, you see uh, an overall uh, blood oxygenation curve, and you see that for the untrained cases, there was a significant prefrontal cortex activity, whereas that was not the case for the trained cases. We were also able to identify the exact regions as well as the prefrontal cortex, 
uh, where this activity has uh, happened. And it is known that this region is uh, associated with complex decision making, uh, with uh, 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 analytical processes, which are arguably a part of the uh, analytical reason. What this uh, data show is first of all our experimental paradigm works. The behavioral data show that we were able to instill system one thinking uh, in, the in, in the students for the trained cases. Um, we also could demonstrate that there are two independent systems in the brain. Um, and um, that there is an apparent shift from system one to, to system two. Uh, which was represented by a significant difference in prefrontal cortex activity. Now we have published this study uh, recently, but I see that only two minutes, but I want to do one more thing. What I want to mention is that um, this was the first study that only demonstrated that there are two different uh, 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 independent thinking systems, but strictly speaking, we only measured activation of prefrontal cortex during system two thinking for the unfamiliar case. What happened to the others? And we did have a follow-up study on this recently, here with only 10 students. But what we did is we went back to the learning phase. And during the learning phase, we started to measure their brain activity as well. So not only during the test phase, but during the learning phase. And what is to be expected is that at the beginning of the learning phase, these cases are also unfamiliar. So there you should also see a significant prefrontal cortex activity. They are really they have to make sense of it and they have to analytically deal with these cases. And while they are learning during the learning phase, this analytical reasoning, uh, system two reasoning, should <coughs> disappear into system one reasoning. That's what we have seen with the outcome of the first study. Uh, that is exactly what you, what you see. Initially, these cases are also unfamiliar, but the more you get familiar with them, the more uh, you, you are confronted with it, the more you deal with it, you see a significant decrease, which again confirms that there are two different brain, brain systems involved. Now this is what I, what I just uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, it seems to be that indeed there are two different brain systems involved in the, the in, in, in dual process theory. Um, of course, the next step would be to look a little bit more deeper in where you know, what, what other processes are there? We again show only the shift from system one to system two, but uh, from system two to system one, but where is system one located is still not really known. It just should be, could be somewhere related to more uh, 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 memory uh, systems, which is more hippocampal areas, but with this system we cannot penetrate too deep to actually see where this uh, uh, is located. Uh, as Camilla said, only a penetration of two centimeters and uh, that is uh, next on the, uh, on the agenda, also to look at some parts of how this learning transfers to related, uh, to related cases. Now uh, that's uh, the eruption in a nutshell is what we have done. So do we have any questions? We've got time for a quick one. Can I ask you, do, would this help us if people, we, presumably your experts, will all have the fast system activated? Um, but does that ever let us down? So if it's about pattern recognition, um, sometimes patterns aren't quite what we expect them to be or what they should be, and that may perhaps be where you start to get medical error. So could this help us unpick some of that and, <coughs> and help us train people to um, perhaps override the FAST system when they need to? That's, that's, that's a very good, uh, good question. If you look at, look right now, indeed, you can only see whether a certain level of expertise has been reached. Uh, but of course, it could be also biased. It could be that you think you know the answer. And, uh, uh, it becomes then a little bit more complex to really look at, uh, the, at uh, the, the brain processes, but the interaction between system one and system two, I think, plays an important role. You think you have the answer, but you have to switch to a more analytical system. And this interaction between these two systems is indeed uh, uh, what we have to look in next, and how do biases represent in this, uh, 
in, in this context. Uh, it, it's, it's, it certainly was on the agenda, but I think with F mirrors, it is not possible to, uh, to look at the more complex brain systems uh, as such. So, so what would you need to look at, at that? What sort of technology can you use to look at that? I think the first step is to look where is system one situated? Where does it go during the train? And, uh, uh, and there, with the activation of system one, what other process influences in the brain? There is not really a theory that you could find that, uh, that, 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 that proposes a hypothesis, but you have to look at more the the, uh, the entire brain, which requires fMRI and uh, deeper, deeper measures of uh, deeper penetration of the, of the brain. Okay, that sounds like that might be transformed my dead in two years' time. <laughs> then. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. So, uh, moving on, our next uh, presentation is on implementation of QStream in a two week ophthalmology rotation in LKC Medicine and is presented for us by Johnson Sachs. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm going to present our data on the implementation of QStream in a two week ophthalmology rotation in LKC Medicine. Yeah, okay. All right. So our year three medical students at LKC undergo a two-week rotation in uh, ophthalmology, which is a really short period of time. And that's all they get in the entire curriculum. There's no more ophthalmology rotation in year four or year five. And to meet all the training requirements and learning outcomes in such short duration, the learning has to be maximized to, to enable them to learn as much as they can and retain as much as they can in that two-week period. In our current rotation activities, we have um, TBL, team-based learning, we have case-based learnings, so we have e-modules as well as MCQs at the end of e-modules that students are supposed to attempt it themselves. We have face-to-face -face tutorials with students, we teach them clinical skills, uh, uh, ophthalmology clinical skills transfer, and as well as endoscopy with the mannequins. Mm -hmm. We send them to the clinics, to the ORs for observations. We also have formative assessments such as slide quiz, mini CX, and also rotation, uh, mid-rotation SBAs. Okay. So what I feel about, despite all these things that we have in place for the students, uh, what I find is deficient in the current activity is the lack of atomic science recognition, which is extremely important, especially in ophthalmology. It's all about pattern recognition, visual recognition. You see, you see, you don't see, you don't see. Okay. So how do I, my problem is how do I maximize this, this skill? skills learning in pattern recognition and how that and, and should I do it effectively and make sure that they retain it and remember it within such a short period of time of only two weeks. So we've decided that we will use QStream as a platform. So QStream is actually a micro-learning online platform that's been shown to increase knowledge retention through space education. This was co-founded by uh, Dr. Ker uh, Kerfoot from uh, Harvard Medical School about a decade ago. So it's based on the principles of spacing effect as well as testing effect. In spacing effect, when, when knowledge is uh, introduced at interval, it helps to reinforce their learning and the memory. And uh, testing effect shows that testing can improve knowledge when it's combined with immediate answer feedback. So we've, we've, uh, we've come up with a uh, Q-stream for ophthalmology during the two-week rotation. We've selected 12 essential retinal funder photographs with the corresponding diagnosis. And each day, the Q-stream will send out five random photographs Either either on via email or on the WhatsApp uh, on the QStream app, and the student has to match the photograph to the correct diagnosis in the form of extended matching question. And we deliberately chose this because this eliminates all the other cues from 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 the stem from the stem itself. In a typical SBA that we write for exams, there's always a vignette, there's a lead in, and students may not even know what it is, but from certain keywords, for example, like cherry red spot, for example, uh, dun, 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 um, so that peer written in, oh, okay, this is supposedly a CRAO, without even recognizing that it is a CRAO, for example. So we decided that it should be, there should be no, no lead, there are no, no cues at all, just purely pattern recognition. And um, students are supposed to match it with SPR, uh, standard matching options, and immediately we get answer feedback, and um, the correct, correct answers will be repeated four to six days later within the posting, and will need be repeated once. So let's say the student get it wrong, the question will be repeated twice in the two-week rotation every one to three days. So have a look at how it looks like. So this is how it looks like from the app, from the, from the iPhone WhatsApp QStream app. So it comes up with a picture, what is the diagnosis? There's nothing else but the source diagnosis. Shows you a finder's photo and students have to choose from what it is. So uh, I got it wrong, okay? So I chose uh, branch retina after occlusion. This is what I chose. 
But the correct answer is a CRAO, Central Retina Artery Occlusion with a thick mixed array. And over here, you can see that there's a percentage. It shows you the amount of classmates who have done the post things together with you. How many of you got it correct? So I'm the only participant in this study, so I'm the only one who got 100% wrong. Okay. So sorry, your answer is incorrect, and that's what you have. And immediately next to it, there will be an explanation of what it is. What is CRAO, and there are annotations and arrows to show you what exactly we're supposed to see. And the student goes on to the next question. So they do that five questions a day, easily. Yeah. So we've surveyed all our students who have done this uh, stream during the rotation. So all our 90 students, year 3 medical students in the last academic year, participated in the survey at the end of the uh, rotation. And the aim is to answer a question on, is it effective? Does it cut down face-to-face -face time so that I have focused on other aspects of the teaching rotation? And is it overall, is it effective or not? So it's based on a five-point record scale from strongly agree to agree, neutral, disagree, and strongly disagree. So this is what we have. We have 69 respondents out of the 90 with a 76.7% response rate, and average rate about 21 years old, which is for typical year three medical students we have. Um, two thirds are male, one third female, and 70% um, uh, have did, uh, had a, the training rotation at TTSH, which is our, our, one of our main hospitals, and another in an institution at Kuala Lumpur Hospital. So we have four questions, four survey questions on effectiveness of QStream. So the first question asks you, does it help you to focus on what you need to know in year three? And 100% of them say yes. The blue uh, indicates strongly agree and the red is agree. So 100% of them feel that it's true. it helps them to focus on what they need to know. And 90, 99% feels that the repeated question help them, help them to reinforce knowledge retention. And 86% feels that it prepares them for the clinical rotation in the ophthalmology. And most of them, okay, they, more than 90% feels that it helps them, make them more confident in picking up signs on the fundoscopy and uh, fundal photographs. And we have four, five questions, uh, five survey questions on whether it cuts down on face-to-face -face timing. And again, uh, we ask them, does it encourage self-learning? Does the explanation to the answers allow the tutors to focus on other aspects of teaching other than just pattern recognition during a short rotation? Does it augment other modes of learning? And is it easier to administer compared to a conventional classroom quiz? And also, does it provide students with the flexibility to attempt the essay when they do it? Yeah. Like for me personally, when I do it, it's the first time I wake up in the morning, I will switch on my phone, and I, I go to the app and just answer three questions before I shower and brush my teeth. <laughs> so that's how fast and how easy it is to do it. And uh, response rate has been good again, from really for 78%, 90%, to all the way to about 90, 97%. Strongly agree or agree with all these answers. And 100% with all of them responded that they find it is overall useful in the learning uh, during the rotation itself. And with additional comments, and comments have been really great and fantastic. And most of them want more questions. They want more questions, more questions, and more questions, please. And they want a good mix of funders questions, and not just what we not just funders questions. They want other questions on anterior segment photographs, on ocular motility, movements, neuroophthalmology, for example. And they also want multiple images of the same condition. Because after you're used to seeing the same CRAO picture, and they, um, they want more varieties, how other CRAO pictures present with, so they can able to recognize different uh, patterns, not only just one pattern of a CRAO. Um, they also feel that uh, repeated quizzing helps them to reinforce their knowledge, and more cases again, and they find it's very useful. It enables them to read up and do their own readings based on the questions that, they, that they've been tested on. Uh, but a few students again, they commented it should not compromise on face-to-face -face teaching time. That is still very important uh, in the clinical rotation. So based on what we have, uh, we have studied, we have surveyed our students, our data support the, the Patrick's level 1 data that the students find it favorable, it's useful uh, at level 1 level. Students find that it's very uh, uh, useful for them to prepare for their clinical rotation. About 86% of them strongly or agree that it prepares them. The other 40% may feel that it's maybe not as adequate. Why is that so? Probably because this only focus on clinical uh, pattern recognition. There are still other aspects of the rotation that the students need to learn, such as uh, skills, bedside manners, management issues, management scenarios, which we have not uh, covered during the Q stream, uh, Q stream rotation. And um, most of them again, they feel that it strongly agree or agree that it cuts down on the face-to-face -face teaching time. And again, all of them feel that it's very useful for their uh, rotation. So this is based on the principles of the uh, of, of the forgetting curve in nine. 1855, which is many, many years ago, uh, uh, Dr. Hermann uh, Ebbinghaus, he's a German psychologist, okay, studied, experimented on learning and uh, retention, and came up with this curve called the forgetting curve. Okay, so what it shows that is that when you first introduce a knowledge to somebody, the, uh, the knowledge that you retain decays exponentially over time. 
However, with the spacing effect, meaning that if you would reintroduce the, the knowledge again over, over a space interval, students do remember better and they learn better that way. That's based on the principle of spacing effect. And also a testing effect. It's a psychological finding that the initial testing does not merely serve to evaluate their performance, but it also alters the learning process itself. It helps them to uh, remember better and to improve their retention. Okay, and on, on this landmark paper by Dr. Kerfu, that's about a decade ago when he published, he, he did a study uh, with space education with urology students. Again, he shows that students uh, who were exposed to space education do much better in terms of scores at the end of the year. Um, and the best optimal space interval will be repeated questions, uh, emails, okay, to the students over a long extended period of time. All the way from, find that from the 6, eight, six to 11 months, that's where the, the best difference is that you see. Whereas if you find that if you were to introduce space uh, education just in a pretty short period of time, like two months or one week, the effect may not be as marked or as, uh, as useful. So our limitations of study is that um, it's only limited to clinical science, only on funders. There's no other aspects of uh, pharmacology which I've tested on. It's only limited to one subspecialty, and it's a short duration of study, only for two weeks, and a short spacing duration. Okay, I did not extend it beyond the two-week rotation. Ideally, we should go even beyond after the finished rotation till the end of the academic year. And there's no lack of testing effect, that, uh, which ideally we should incorporate into the, uh, into the curriculum. So maybe what we can do in future is if we can include other photographs other than the funders, we can include other kind of questions that we can introduce, not only just on pattern recognition, but also on uh, other, other things like um, management skills, um, skills transfer, um, physical examination skills. All these things can be, uh, can be incorporated in QStream itself. And I can increase the spacing effect. So maybe not only just during a two week of rotation, but even beyond the rotation itself, all the way to the end of the academy. Maybe once a week, once a fortnight, I'll send them questions on ophthalmology, such that by the end of the of three of the academic year, they'll be very well versed in uh, pattern recognition in ophthalmology. And um, this is something that we did not do, but something that can, it's worth considering is that we can compare the end of posting scores, okay, uh, end of the posting scores and end of the year scores, okay, in terms of the ophthalmology. Uh, questions and see whether there's an improvement in the student's course before and after the implementation of QStream. So in conclusion, we find that it's a useful as adjunct to traditional teaching methods to encourage learning, to enhance knowledge retention, and also helps to cut down on face-to-face -face timing uh, teaching, especially so in a very short rotation of pharmacology, which only two weeks, I can focus on other aspects of teaching, such as basic manner, such as management skills, such as, uh, such as management decision matrix. And this also allows the students more time to focus on other things other than just uh, learning on ophthalmology, science recognition. And also allows them to do it at their own flexibility of time as and when they want it. Thank you. Uh, questions, really interesting study. Any, any questions from anyone? So, can I, can I start off then? And I'm really pleased to see that you're thinking of looking at this at, 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 at over an extended period um, because, of course, it's, it's quite easy to show learning over quite a short time and memory over quite a short time. I was fascinated by the fact that uh, some of your free text comments, and we, and we didn't have chance to read them all, that some of the students seem to feel it could reduce face time with member of staff, but others didn't want that to happen. So what was kind of the overall impression that you got about that? Students obviously really like this tool. Mm -hmm. um, how did they feel it fitted into the curriculum with, in terms of their, their face time with faculty? Um, it has not cut out of face time actually. We still, still do a lot of fair amount of face time with students, but um, I focus on other aspects such as uh, problem, problem solving. Rather than just teaching them this is a sign that they need to recognize these are the important features to look out for. So we do not really cut down on face time, but allows me to focus on other aspects of the, of the, of the curriculum itself. So the, the interesting point about some students want feel that it cuts down on face time, some students want more face time. But I think um, they want more face time because there are other aspects which are not covered in QStream. So we, they have more opportunity for them to clarify what they do not know. Yeah. Right, so you were using this for the sort of, perhaps the simple, Pattern recognition. Exactly. Yes. That's right. More complex That's right. Stuff in yes, correct. It's not to replace any part of the curriculum, but it's an adjunctive tool to uh, to enhance the learning process in a very short period of time. 
And so what's your next stage going to be? Are you, are you planning the long-term study? Or? Um, so the next stage will be probably to roll it up. Um, maybe you want to look at the end for more extended period of space education instead of just two weeks. Two weeks is really short. They, they learn everything in two weeks. But by the time the exam comes five months later, six months later, they probably will forget about everything. So the, the, the space effect is not as effective. So I need to lengthen the space effect. So that will probably be in the terms of every fortnightly or once a month, a couple of questions of homology. And this will go all the way on until they finish their academic year exams. So from then we can see whether there's a difference. We can compare our this year's academic year or the last academic year's exam with future batches and you'll see whether there's a difference in the test scores in terms of homology questions. I mean, one of the really interesting things about that will be to see if students carry on doing those questions once they're not on the ophthalmology rotation, and if they suddenly pick them up again just before the exam, you know, will they keep using that practice? And I think that alone will be a fascinating question to ask. It is, and the thing we need to take note of is that we shouldn't overburden and overload our students. So this is only ophthalmology, because imagine all the other specialties that we have, dermatology, rheumatology, AME, anesthesia, whatnot. So imagine getting these questions every fortnightly. So basically, it's Almost every day they get questions on different aspects of the world here, of, of the curriculum. So um, it's good in a way that they keep them updated and uh, keep them on the ball, so which is should make sure they still remember what they've learned. But I'm um, also worried about burning them out as well. So that is something we need to, we need to worry about. Yes. Quick question, Anthony. It's not what you were looking to answer, but how does the that translate to being able to do it in real life? Looking at photographs is not the same as. Yes, that's right. That, uh, it's, it's a bit different, but at least they can recognize what are certain features to look out for. So you know, another thing that we did just last year for the for the OSCE exam was I used real photographs and I, I printed them into slides and I put it in the mannequins and used it for the OSCE station at the end of the exam. So they are looking through the mannequins with the real fundoscope and with a slide of a real picture set uh, of, a, of a real fundus. And so that helps them to reinforce what they have learned as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next presentation um, is going to be a dual performance from <laughs> Caroline Morton and Joe Horsburgh, and they're going to be speaking about exploring self-efficacy in computational medicine students. Caroline Morton, so I am one of the course leads for um, this module, Computation Medicine. Do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, I'm Jo Horsburgh, I'm a Principal Teaching Fellow in Medical Education. And um, we went a bit new agey uh, today, so we went for Twitter handles rather than the email addresses, so uh, feel free to tweet us. Okay, so uh, I suspect some of you are wondering what is computational medicine, so it's a good question. It is a fourth year module um, that runs an imperial for intercalating medical students. So instead of coming to do a dissertation, um, a lab project perhaps, they can come and spend 10 weeks with us. And the, the idea of this is we take medical students and we teach them computer programming. So they get 10 weeks of um, immersed within computer science. Uh, and that really breaks down into taking novices, giving them a very intense practical coding course, which lasts about four weeks. They get some time to develop a project, and then they go and execute that project. And in terms of learning outcomes for the whole uh, 10 week module, there's obviously the practical coding aspects, but we're also very interested in computational thinking. And the way to think about computational thinking is it's taking a big, messy problem and then splitting it into small, solvable components and then communicating computational ideas. And the reason that we talked about, um, we started to think about self-efficacy is that I run a two-day version, a very, very condensed version of uh, introduction to programming for medical students. Um, and what, we've, what I've really noticed over the last three years of running this course is um, often for students, it's the first time that they've ever really struggled to do something immediately because it is so different from medicine uh, and medicine, in the beginning at least, is quite similar to, to school in terms of science. This is really different, and some students really thrived in that environment and really 
um, had a really different attitude and just really wanted to, to push themselves and some students gave up and we were just a bit curious to find out what is the, the difference between uh, those two groups of students. So we had a conversation about self-efficacy. Uh, yes, what I'll do. Uh, so I'm sure that uh, many of you will know what self-efficacy is. Uh, if you don't, uh, it comes from the work of a social psychologist called Albert Bandura, and he defines self-efficacy as personal judgments of one's capabilities to organise and execute courses of action to attain designated goals. Um, and it's related to things like academic motivation, persistence, and emotional reaction. So there's lots of evidence to show that uh, self-efficacious students are more likely to participate in tasks, more readily uh, to engage, they persist at difficult tasks for longer, and they have fewer adverse emotional reactions when they uh, come across difficulties uh, in learning. So this seemed to uh, sort of help us think about some of the uh, observations that Caroline had had during this uh, her teaching on this two-day uh, course. Um, but we really wanted to kind of explore this further with the students. So um, we conducted uh, a very small uh, pilot study. So the aim of this study wasn't to, uh, to measure self-efficacy in students or to measure it across, the, across time. At this point, we just really wanted to see whether this was going to be a, a helpful conceptual framework for thinking about the difficulties that uh, Caroline uh, had seen. So we really just wanted to explore this with the students. So for, uh, for those reasons, we adopted a qualitative interpretive paradigm for this piece of research. We just carried out one focus group at the end of the 10-week uh, module, and from that, we did uh, some th thematic uh, analysis. So Carol, we're just gonna say a little bit about what we found. All right, so results. So um, we've got four, four um, slides on results, so I'll just go through them quite quickly. Um, so really what the students found was um, existing learning strategies they had didn't really translate into this environment. So um, you know, cramming for lectures, and cramming on the, the, the content in lectures, um, and then taking an exam at the end, which is high stakes, um, didn't work, so they had to adapt. So you have to do constant work for the tutorials and to keep up with your peers. Um, and then really, how if that doesn't work, what do they do? So development of new learning strategies. So we covered quite a lot of things in this, but really they, they started to experiment. So we do lots of examples in class. There's lots of, we keep a, one teaching assistant for every 10 to eight to 10 students. So they've got lots of help around. Um, so a lot of them, what they did is they, they modified classroom examples uh, to their own project or their own problem. They also um, went and found other resources. So because it's coding, there's so much online, lots of YouTube tutorials, lots of free online tutorials of various different formats. Um, and, but we also found that they could, um, they looked at peer support. So I'm a big proponent of using uh, Slack, which I know was mentioned, slack.com, which is been mentioned several times um, already in this conference and that was a really helpful thing for our students and then in terms of how we structured the course um, the the way that we set up the course was there are optional components so there is there is some homework but there are more challenges so it's up to you whether or not you you go and do that and that seemed to help to develop some new learning strategies and this idea of becoming your own tutor um, the thing which was really interesting about the work was it was difficult for the students. So there is an emotional um, cost of having this experience where you're confronted with just not being able to do something the first time you've, you've tried. Um, and some students say, so that's a quote, I've never hit the wall before. Um, and that you need to develop discipline um, to, to come overcome that. And they also found quite reassuringly that teachers don't always know the answer. Um, so, you know, there's lots, especially with coding, but also with medicine, there are multiple different ways to solve a problem. Um, and often if you asked five different teachers, you would get five different answers. 
um, and that was quite reassuring. So then our final um, point was about whether COVID was a forum or made to just tie it back into the self-efficacy. Um, so there was a difference of opinions. So there were some students who thought, no, you have to, you're either good at it, you're detail orientated, you're mathematical, um, and that's why you're a good coder. And then there were other students who said, well, you, you can be good at this if you just put the time and effort in. So there, um, there was a difference in opinion. Sorry. Okay, so in terms of what's next, as we mentioned, this was just a pilot study to see whether this idea would help us to think about some of these, these issues. So we're going to develop this um, next academic year with the next cohort of computational medicine uh, students. We are going to give them some uh, self-efficacy rating uh, scales at various points during the course to see if we can map any uh, changes in uh, self-efficacy and also uh, run some more focus groups with those students uh, next year. And also think about how we might take um, what the students have said this uh, year and uh, use that to support next year's uh, students and that leads into kind of one of our, uh, our recommendations uh, from this. So in terms of take home messages, um, the students found developing these new strategies really difficult, um, both sort of almost cognitively and also uh, emotionally, but ultimately I think lots of them uh, saw the use uh, in that but also that we as faculty are really key in helping students to facilitate these new learning uh, strategies. So often that's around uh, signposting, that might be around signposting uh, the, the difficulties, the challenges, letting students know that this is going to be difficult uh, or challenging, pointing them to uh, resources, um, ensuring that there are learning opportunities to provide it uh, that are challenging that will enable students to develop uh, self-efficacy. Um, but I also think, um, particularly in relation to this, thinking about how we might locate those learning tasks within a student's zone of proximal development. So we don't want them to be too easy, they need to be challenging, but equally if the tasks are too challenging, uh, then the students will give up. So the students need to have a, uh, achieve a certain level of mastery in order to develop their self-efficacy. But also uh, to encourage students to make accurate attributions. And what we mean by that is when Caroline's students come to her and say, I'm just no good at coding, I'm naturally not a good coder, is that an accurate uh, attribution? Is that really the case? Or is it maybe the case that they just haven't necessarily put in the right uh, effort or used the right resources? And equally, when they look at their peers and they say, but they're naturally a great coder, again, is that an accurate attribution? Or is it just that that person has been working a bit harder or has used uh, different different learning methods. Um, so again, this might be uh, a project for the next Transform Med Ed uh, conference. Um, we're really happy to share our references um, if anybody's interested. And as Caroline says, we're both on Twitter, so come find us there. Thank you. back on a paper that we're submitting, uh, which is looking at um, coding in this two-day course, which was our original uh, project. And that's not looking at self-efficacy, but it does come up in some of the data that you get back, uh, that we've got back. Um, and, you know, I guess it's just trying to, we use the data from that to inform this study. And it would be great in the future to be able to include it. I think practically speaking with the two-day course, is it's not just for medical students. So I've been really keen to keep it free for medical students. And the way that we do that is we charge doctors and nurses and researchers and anyone else who wants to come to learn coding, they 
uh, pay for it and that means that the medical students get to come for free. So it might just require a little bit more thinking about that, but it's a really good point. Does that answer your question? Yes. Ah, I, I, oh, sorry. There's a question over here. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so um, the strategies, so it was partly how we set up the course. So when we were designing the course, um, I really looked at tech companies and what tech companies do to provide, you know, we have some hugely successful companies, Google, Apple, and how do they set up their teams to be able to facilitate, you know, some of, I think we'd all agree, pretty productive work. Um, so the way that we did that is we split them into um, colours. I'm not very imaginative, so they, they were cut they were into red, yellow, green and blue groups. And then we made them all sit together for every session that they had. Now, it's pretty intense in the, the beginning. What you found was students just started to talk to each other. They had their own Slack group with their colour um, and all their peers. And then they were able to provide tutoring. They had some group tasks that they had to, to do together. Um, but really that was a means of getting them to, to bond as a group and then they started to tutor because there are there are some people who really um, really like coding and want to do all of the extra challenges and all the extra bits maybe go away and do some extra tutoring and then they are able to come back and share that with their peers so it really came from tech companies okay, thank you very much indeed I'm afraid we're out of time so our last uh, session for, uh, for today is um, teaching and learning at scale, designing for quality engagement in online programs by Professor Helen Ward, Dr. Eugene Chinchon. I think again you're doing a two-hander, aren't you? So over to you. Oh, I can't Really saving energy or something. <laughs> 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 Hi, so I'm Helen Ward, I'm Director of Education in the School of Public Health, and my co presenter is wandering around. Yeah, for some reason. This is active learning. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Get as far away as possible. I'm going to try and use this space. I'm Guido Chimchon, I'm the Director for Digital Learning um, and Innovation at Imperial College. So our presentation is, is slightly different in that <laughs> we have no evidence <laughs> to present, so apologies for that. Next, Transform MedEd will, will give you the evidence of whether we were right in what we're doing. Okay, so um, we're talking about teaching and learning at scale um, and whether or not all the things that we think we do well in on-campus courses, can we scale this to large numbers of students but maintain the quality and engagement? Um, so the background to this is that I'm in public health and uh, about 10 years ago actually we set up a Master in Public Health course and we started with 27 students and within a few years we had 70 students on the course and we're full, physically full, we just can't take any more students. And we now have about 10 to 12 applicants per place every year and we could, on quality of the applications, we could take a lot more students, but we can't. So then we think, well, there is a demand, obviously, but there's also a need for a lot more postgraduate training in public health. So how do we actually address that? So that's what we're going to talk about now. And so this then linked into, and the opportunity for doing this linked to, to the development of the digital learning strategy. So, so we teamed up, uh, and the digital learning strategy is, uh, is three pillars. One is uh, we want to create at Imperial an excellent student and teacher experience. And I want to always emphasize the teacher experience as well. I think that's an undervalued part of the way we are addressing and improving the learning uh, experience. The second is um, to pioneer new ways of learning through innovation and technology uh, and entrepreneurship. So what is what is edtech? What can the new edtech um, technologies that are in the work in the in out there, what can they mean for our uh, for our learning and teaching experience? And then the third, and I guess.
guess that really touches on uh, why it was uh, connected so well to the uh, master's in public health is taking the imperial learning experience uh, beyond uh, the campus borders. So, uh, I mean, it's great that we can uh, educate a small number of excellent students uh, on our campus, but there are also excellent students in other places around the world, and why would we withhold them from our knowledge, and how do we impart that to them as well? Oh, and, and the philosophy behind it is that if it's good enough for people outside the campus, it'll also come back and improve the teaching in our own campus, so it's kind of a feedback loop. So, so our pitch was that if we can develop an online degree taught by us, global leaders in education, <laughs> kind of preparing you, students, for a career in health improvement anywhere in the world. So we're talking about a, glo a slightly different angle, really, so it's more global in the, the degree that we're posing, but it's based on the degree we have. And our question, really, is can we deliver this quality research-based degree, which is what we pride ourselves in, at scale? Yeah, and that means thousands and thousands of... Oh, oh shut up. Oh. It means more than <laughs> seven <laughs> things. <laughs> Eight things. So that's our debate. <laughs> so the vision is that we can do this and we can increase access. So why am I involved in this? Why don't I just carry on doing our 60, 70 students, you know, an easy life? Is because I'm really passionate about wanting to increase access to good public health learning. Because I think through that we can have public health impact. We can actually improve public health across the world. Um, and our approach is to use the revolution, to use the, what well, the revolution in technology and the fact that Gidon has come to Imperial. Um, basing it on research, so not just our public health research, but pedagogic research, cognitive research, and so on. And design a course with the explicit idea that we can improve access, we can scale this, and we can keep quality. Over to you. So. If you could click on the This is the data point we have. If you scroll down, this is a Jupyter notebook, by the way. If you don't know it, it's a great down until you get tool a picture. for teaching code. So we okay, code this. Stop. Very exciting. We just put code in there. Um, yeah, this is this is actually so 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 we uh, we started designing the course, but we also wanted to have a feel like would people actually uh, sign up to this? Is there a global demand? And um, after I think three weeks, we had about ten thousand expressions of interest. So people actually went on a site, filled in all the information, and sent it to us. And now I think we're at fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand people. Uh, that are signed up, and we can actually see where they come from. And if you scroll around the world, uh, it's an interactive uh, map. Uh, we see also countries so there that- There you go, there's, there's 1141 uh, expressions of interest from India. Yeah. Nigeria is very high, uh, actually, and Egypt uh, have, uh, uh, have really- This is a geography test now, I'm just gonna <laughs> by using backwards design, which, so we start with what do we want these students to be able to do when they have completed this? So we really start about the intended learning outcomes and therefore start with the assessments. What is, how are we going to test whether or not they have achieved those learning outcomes? And only once we've agreed on those, both at the kind of sub-modular level but also degree as a whole, do we start looking at what, what instructional materials will help students to achieve that? So it's much more closely designed than the on-campus um, material has ever been. Um, and we have, obviously, a range of the usual things online, videos, podcasts, reading. But then the second bit of, of the approach is about mastery learning, which, of course, is not new. And in fact, a lot of what we've heard already in this session is about mastery learning. 
repeated um, ability to learn and show that you can learn and test, retest, spacing it appropriately so that people have then recall. And by doing this online, you can have far more use of quizzes, different types of um, test self-testing, but also peer assessment and building, using peer assessments to start building communities, which is another challenge online. We can also have personalized feedback because this will be auto, you know, a lot of automated um, feedback. And we're very keen to build interaction and the community building because this is most people's concern. How do we get students to feel when they register for a degree that they're part of a community when they're not sitting in the same classroom? They will never come and meet each other except possibly um, when they graduate. <laughs> They'll all get invited to come to London. Um, so we will have discussion forums and group project work and so on. And some of the ideas that have come up today have already given us more ideas for what we can do. But then the next thing is actually how we're going to be able to, to learn and constantly learn through this on the data. And if I just can add a couple of points on the, on the scalability, because again, how do you scale quality? Like, how does this equation help? And actually a lot of the uh, presentations that were uh, presented earlier are things that we will explore in the course of this, uh, of, 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 of the design. So we will start with a small cohort, so more in Helen's line, as we prove that the quality is maintained, and then we add numbers of students in the following years, if, for example, the peer assessment, so you spoke about the, the way of peer, peer teachers uh, in the faculty, if that really works also in a whole um, curriculum, and what we really already see in the design is that some courses are more uh, prone to this and others are more difficult to do. So for example, research project, our biggest challenge in this design right now is how do we scale the research project? A lot of the content we can actually scale quite easily, but it's really about that really hands-on um, mentoring relationship in, a, in the course of a degree that we're kind of interested in figuring out how we can scale that and what that means for our staff, but also what technology can bring. So for example, Sondas is one of our leaders of one of our specializations. I mean, the kind of peer approach will be very relevant, I think, in the health systems. Um, and development that Zondas is leading because actually we'll be able to use students from all over the world to share of their own experiences so they will be able to teach each other if you like. And uh, when it comes to uh, what the technology platform can, uh, can bring to us is uh, really detailed data. Um, so we have uh, very granular data on how the students are um, going through the course. Uh, so it's, it's click screen data. Essentially every time a student clicks, we capture that and we know what they click and when they click, et cetera. Now it's quite a complex task to unpack that and we have a data analyst and she works really closely together with the math department right now and we're figuring out what are the kinds of things we can do. And I just wanted to uh, highlight our approach and give you a little bit of an idea of some of the data that we've explored so far in the existing courses that we have online. So not the MPH, but another course. Which is mixed. Yeah, so it's, it's a, yeah, just maybe on the design of the course, the idea is that the content is all open, but we build high engagement features on top of the open content that constitute the actual credit bearing piece. So everybody can take it online, open, for free. You pay a small fee if you want the assessment. And if you want to be admitted, if you're admitted to the degree, you get access to the actual teachers and professors and there is more engagement that comes at a higher cost and we're trying to figure out what that balance looks like. Uh, but in terms of the data analytics on the, on the MOOC side, um, is we have three, on, the data analysis consists of three parts. One is really the monitoring of, um, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the online courses, which is creating of bespoke dashboards for uh, monitoring on KPIs that we want for the learners to perform on. The second is really optimization. How do we evaluate uh, the current content on the courses? So this is really to improve the current courses. And what kind of uh, um, um, yeah, elements can we build in to test whether things work? So for example, spacing analysis. In a previous uh, uh, life, uh, we did some analysis on spacing in video and see if videos are uh, so you, you can actually see if students go back more, and is that then a complex video? Is that a, 
an important video or is that a rubbish video? <laughs> you know, you, you have to kind of assess that. And the third is really about research. So uh, can we actually create data as a service, data analytics, learning analytics as a service for researchers like yourself that have a question, but then we can provide you with the data um, based on, on, on these models. And what you see here is essentially, this is a very simple, not, not machine learning, not, nothing like that, but a very easy way of looking at where we can improve the course. This is the progression of the course of how people go through the course. Uh, in, in the way they actually go through the assessments. So there are, uh, yeah, there are all these assessments, and here you essentially see the drop-off rate. And the biggest drop-off rates are essentially after assignment three and after ass uh, assignment in module three. So what we then can do is go back and see, is there a specific reason for that big drop-off? Um, and, and, and when we unpack that, we also were able to kind of See, okay, this is just one example, is uh, that, that we can see that in, in this assignment, for example, the biggest drop-off was actually with people that has less than a high school diploma. Um, so we can, we can start clustering types of um, learners and, and see how they perform as they are progressing through the course, and then find interventions uh, that we can, uh, we can do to improve, in this case, the optimization of the um, of, of the courses. Maybe the assignment is too heavy, maybe the assignment is uh, not really explained very well, or it actually doesn't test what they've learned in the, in the videos before. And I, I think that this is really a, a huge benefit that you have in the online learning space. So, um, just to finish, um, we, so we're partnered with Coursera to do this, and this is the sort of landing page on Coursera Imperial College. So this is the first full degree that Imperial College will be doing with a big online provider. Um, we will open for applications in January and then <laughs> drown possibly with the number of applicants um, who we still have to do in the good old fashioned Imperial way which will be you know, reading them all, you know, <laughs> manuscripts probably. But anyway, we, we will see what happens with that. But the first intake will be October. 2019, and yeah, we will be recording at future conferences, and MOOC material will start to be available early in the new year, so we'll start to generate the kind of data, so we'll be able to improve the course even before it launches as a degree, so um, watch this space, and thank you. I think we can probably squeeze in one very quick question. In the degree bit, we'll use some peer assessment, but there will be faculty and uh, teaching assistant marked things as well. So at the moment, we are looking in detail at the assessment strategy because our aim is to scale this to two or three hundred students a year. Um, it's a two-year course, so that'll be 500, 600 students at any one time. So we we clearly we don't want to have 500, 10,000 word essays every two weeks. So we've got to think about different ways. So there'll be things we'll be using uh, various, you know, the Jupyter notebooks will be doing the programming stuff, but the statistics and so on we'll be doing. But we'll be using peer assessments as hopefully formative before a final thing. So, but there's lots of other assessment methods. I really wish I was in the other session on the death of the MCQ, but I'm not here. I'm sorry you stuck with us. So, um, okay, thank you very much. And we'll be thinking of you screening your 15,000 um, applications and uh, let us know how you get on next year. So thank you very much. So just as we can bring the, the session to a close, first of all, I'd like to, to thank all our speakers. You know, we've really 
covered a lot of ground this morning. We've gone from thinking about what's going on in the brain while we're learning. We've thought about how we actually present content using repetition and testing and cognitive task analysis. We thought about our modes of delivery, using peer to deliver teaching, challenging students. And we've gone right from the what's going on in one brain to thinking about delivering programs for hundreds of students. So we've really encompassed thinking about how we learn, I think, from both ends of the spectrum and all points in between. So thank you, everybody, for your contributions, uh, both as speakers and as, as question askers. Thank you to the people who have helped us here, keeping our slides and things flowing so, so beautifully. So it's been a great session. Thank you very much. Thank you.